Hello, I'm Leon Conrad, and I would like to take you through the basics of Laws of Form. This is a first session in a series of sessions taking you through a book that comes in many forms. I have said much in the introductory video about the essence of the book and how I see it linking to the 1979 cover of the paperback edition. So do go back and look at that if you'd like more information about uh, that side of things, the artistic way into it. But this course is going to be a close reading of the main text of Laws of Form, which opens with the frontispiece. It's taken from the Tao Te Ching. This is verse 3 of the Tao Te Ching. In James Legg's English translation, it reads, Conceived of as having no name, it is the originator of heaven and earth. It appears on what could be termed page number zero. Spencer Brown has a pattern of using zero as a starting point, indicating nothing as an origination. And in conversations, he said, well, we can't really call it something because it isn't anything, but we can't really call it nothing either. It is fullness, potentiality. In a lion's teeth, he uses zero as a starting point for the numbering of his stories and his subsections. Have a look at the book, it's interesting. In the German edition of his text, he summarises the whole work as follows. He reduces it to one principle, canon zero, co-production. And that he defines as follows. What something is and what it is not are identical in the form. And we'll explore this a bit more. It is what makes the difference between looking at content which can differ and form which doesn't. And this is one of the sticking points between people who appreciate Brownian approaches and those who say, oh, Brownian system is just Boolean algebra reinvented. Well, there are similarities between the two systems, and you can build a Boolean system on the foundations of Brownian system, but the Brownian system gives the foundations. You see, in the Boolean system, you have ones and zeros. Binary thinking, that's what computers are made up of. In the Brownian system, you have the mark. In the Boolean system, one stands for the universe, in which case, what is zero? Where does the universe contain zero? In the Brownian system, it's all part of the form. In the Boolean system, one equals true, zero equals false. In the Brownian system, you have marked and unmarked states. And most importantly, in the Boolean system, there is no inclusion of the medium in which or on which the marks are made. I say in which and on which because if you have an idea, you have it in the mind, and if you're writing down your idea in marks on paper, they are on the paper. And in the Brownian system, the unmarked state is equivalent to the surface or medium in which or on which the marks are made. Spencer Brown, in the 1994 limited edition of his book, talks about a triple identity, a definitional identity of reality, appearance and awareness. He calls it a triunion, a three-in-one. And he says all the building blocks of existence appear as triunions. He quotes Sakyamuni in Konza's translation. And this quote is really interesting. Existence is duality. Non-existence is non-duality. So, what is the form? Here's how he defines it. And this comes from page one. All my page references will be to the 2011 edition, which has this as its opening salvo. We take as given the idea of distinction and the idea of indication. But what does he mean by idea? It means an archetype. 
he's linking to Platonic ideas, to the Greek eidos, to an act of seeing, perception, awareness, appearance. And what about the idea of distinction? Well, here's how he defines it. Distinction is perfect continence. To create a distinction, you need a boundary with separate sides, an inside or an outside, just as you have if you draw a circle, suspended in some kind of space. Once you draw that distinction, the spaces, states or concept, contents on each side of the boundary can be indicated. And then he's moving to indication and then to value. And from value to naming. The calling of a name can be identified with the value of the content, so he moves to calling. But we're still in the idea of distinction. They're all contained in it. What about the idea of indication? Well, it's quite simply this. If you've made a distinction, you can indicate the inside or the outside. If you're indicating one, you're not indicating the other. It's that simple. And he then moves on to the two primary axioms, the law of calling and the law of crossing. The law of calling states that the value of a call made again is the value of the call. And again, a close reading takes the word value and asks, what does it mean? Well, it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root, val, to be strong. And that gives the Latin valere, which also has the idea of strength, but also worth, power, ability and health in it. If something's healthy, it is working at full power, potency. And that's the root of the old English word wielding, which is to rule. Rulership has potency, it has power, it has health and vigour. It also has um, worth. The old French word valoir is value, worth. And we get the word valiant, right? Worth because of intrinsic value. And in old church Slavonic, we get vlasti, power and valour and validity in English. So all these things are contained in the act of calling, in the form. And for any name to recall is to call. But in that word, he indicates two senses of the word recall. To call again and to remember. In the form, to call is to recall. And if the content is of value, a motive or an intention or instruction to cross the boundary into the content can be taken to indicate this value. The crossing can be identified with the value of the content, which takes us into the law of crossing. And the law of crossing states that the value of a crossing made again is not the value of the crossing. What does this mean? Well, if you want to cross a boundary and then cross it again, hmm, let's look at what this looks like. Here's a boundary. We're going to cross it. That means going from one side to the other. Let's say we're moving a sack of potatoes from the outside of the circle to the inside of the circle. And then we're doing it again. We're moving the sack of potatoes from the inside to the outside. Now, in the form, the sack of potatoes has not changed its location in relation to the circle, in relation to the form. This is not about going from left to right. This is about whether it's outside or inside the distinction. It's always marked. It's still a sack of potatoes. Hence, he says, the value indicated by the two intentions taken together is the value indicated by none of them. The sack of potatoes is still on the outside of the circle after those two moves have been 
taken. To recross is not to cross. And that sums up the basics of laws of form. We then take it into the sandbox and play and make marks. And that will be the subject of session two. Thank you for your attention.